Well, I want to speak to you for just a few minutes today on this thought. Great success requires great commitment. Great success requires great commitment. I've heard it said that in our culture, people don't like commitment. And there is some evidence for that. We don't like to make commitment to a cable program, or we don't like to make a commitment to a phone company. We like our options. But it's really not true that we don't like commitment. You like your bank to be committed to not calling in your mortgage, right? You, you like that commitment. You like it when your spouse is committed to you. You like it when your kids are committed uh, to you. We love commitment, and Jesus calls for commitment. Uh, anything that is successful requires commitment, be it a marriage, be it a career, be it your family. Um, if you want to have success in your finances or your health, you got to have commitment. Athletes have to have commitment if they're going to be successful. I, I read this morning on the internet about a, a woman that uh, won the Prefontaine uh, running trials, or whatever they call it, track meet, out in Oregon, and uh, she set one of the fastest, uh, she ran one of the fastest times this year, and they were talking about her uh, going to be in the Olympics in Paris this year, and she began to talk about her commitment and what she committed to do, and here's the point, anytime that we have success, We've got to have commitment. If you want great success, you can't have a half-hearted commitment. You've got to be all in. Everybody say all in. All in. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for people that are all in. In 1519, uh, Hernan Cortez arrived in the New World. I don't know how they called it the New World. Uh, there were already people there, but nevertheless, he arrived according to history books, in the New World. And uh, he had a mission, and he had 600 soldiers. Now, supposedly, what he said was, if you want to take the island, you got to sink the boats, or you got to burn the boats. Now, he actually did not burn the boats, but he did sink them. And the message that he was giving to his soldiers was this. If you, want to, if you want to be successful, if you want to take the island, you've got to have complete and utter and total commitment. There are no other options. You either have success or you die. And that is really the kind of follower that Jesus is looking for. You say, wait a minute, isn't that a little bit radical? Well, would it be radical for the God of the universe to become human and die on a cross in our place to forgive us of our sins, to take the punishment of the entire world on himself, even though he was innocent and even though he was God? That's a little bit radical, don't you think? Aren't you glad that God's committed to you? Aren't you glad that God is committed to forgiving sins? Aren't you glad that God is committing to saving people? Well, we love commitment, and God wants us to be committed to him as well. I'm going to read today from Mark chapter 8, and we're going to read the words of Jesus. Now, all scripture, I believe, is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. It's God's word. But I particularly like the words of Jesus um, as they're recorded for us in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. If you have a Bible, you can follow along, uh, or you can follow along on the screen. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, we get in our culture, and the Bible certainly teaches, that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you got to deny yourself. It's not about you. It's not about your agenda. You have to be willing to make some sacrifices, right? But I want you to see in the context of what Jesus is talking about, that's, that is a message, but it's not the primary message of what Jesus was saying here. I'll explain that in just a minute. He says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? That sounds like an oxymoron. That sounds like a total contradiction. 
If you want to save your life, lose it. Then he goes on, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. This interesting, radical commitment that God thinks is expected. It's not out of the ordinary for a follower of Christ. It's not out of the ordinary for a believer. It's not out of the ordinary for a Christian. It's what's expected. He said, if you're going to gain your life, be willing to lose it. If you're going to, you know, keep your life, you know, you are going to lose it. I'll explain that in just a minute. He says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? You ever think on that? You ever wonder if we climb the ladder of success all the way to the top, and when we get there, we find out the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall the whole time? The fact is, we make commitments in our life a lot of times that are not the right commitments. No, it's nothing wrong with being committed to your job and to a lot of things, but look, Jesus is telling us there is a way to gain your life. There is a way not to lose your life. And he's not talking about dying. And let me just illustrate, and I'll finish reading in a second. Let me illustrate this for you. Um, I've seen this happen as a pastor. I've done, I don't even know how many funerals I've done over my lifetime. But I do remember one in particular. I did my grandmother's funeral. And I'll never forget, in fact, I did both my grandmother's funerals. But when my mother's mother, my Granny Dorothy, as we used to call her, and um, she was just a wonderful woman, but when my grandpa died, she turned inward. This was a woman that had always helped others, always served others, but she turned inward. Now, nobody is blaming her for mourning, and nobody is blaming her for you know, being concerned. But the truth is, she lost who she was. She'd had a tragedy in her life. Her husband, you know, my grandma and grandpa, interesting story. My grandpa, I think he was 17 or 18 years old, and he went into this little boarding house to get supper on a Monday night, and there was a beautiful young Teenage girl there, her name was Dorothy Wagner. They met on a Monday. They'd never met before. They'd never seen each other before. They'd never talked to each other before. That Friday, they got married. And they were only married until my grandpa died for over 50 years. But I want you to think about this. This woman that for all of her life, she had grown up working. She had uh, four children Uh, She worked on my grandpa's farm. Uh, She was a hard, hard working woman. She always served others. But when her lover, her soulmate, her husband of over 50 years died, she turned inward. It all became about her. And you know what happened? She lost her life. I don't mean she died, but I mean that she lost everything in her life that was precious to her, everything in life that had meaning to her. And finally, my mother, thank God for my mom. She had a lot of wisdom. She went to my grandmother and she told her, she said, Mama, you've got to get over this. Oh, she got so upset. How can you say that? Uh, I've lost my husband, lost your dad. You are so insensitive. And my mother told her, she said, unless you get back, listen to what my mom told her, serving in church, helping other people, you too are going to die. And my grandmother took her advice. And she got back in church. And she got to serving others. The thing that she had done, you know what she did? She gave up her life. She lost her life. She gave it away so that she could find it. And she got her life again. And and in the same way, here's what God is saying to you. If you live all about you, if you live all about just what you can accomplish and earning another dollar and getting another house and getting another car or being able to retire early or whatever it is, whatever you're living for in this life, don't get me wrong, you need to have a job. And it's good to save, 
And if you can retire early, God bless you. Thank God for that, all right? But I want you to understand something. What God is looking for is for you to give your life away. And in doing that, you'll find it. You'll find meaning in life that you never knew existed. And by the way, do you know why there are some Christians that they get saved and they are committed to church and, man, they are all in? We've had so many people like that over the years. They're all in, man. They're so happy. They're so filled with joy. And when you meet them, you're like, man, that person is a true Christian. And then maybe their schedule changes. Maybe they get busy. Maybe they just don't feel it anymore. And before you know it, they're not committed like they once were. And inevitably, and I've, God only knows how many people I've witnessed. And once again, this is anecdotal evidence. I realize, but I'm telling you what I've seen. Without exception, without exception, you know what happened to those people? They became miserable. Miserable. You know what happened? They tried to hold on to their life, and they lost it. But when you and I give our life to Jesus Christ, when we freely serve God by serving others, you know what happens? We find it. We find meaning. We find joy. We find fulfillment. We find, dare I use the word, happiness. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my works in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man, that was a reference to Jesus being the Messiah, he was claiming to be God here. He said, uh, of him will the Son of Man, or will I, Jesus, be also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now Jesus explained that the uh, cost of discipleship was not free. Now don't you understand that? Am I saying that salvation is not free? No, 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 no. Salvation is free. It is a free gift of God. Jesus paid it all, right? That, remember that old song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe? Just don't sing that song before the offering, all right? So Jesus <laughs> paid it all, okay? So salvation is free. That's what we're saying. But you know what Jesus says? The cost of discipleship is not free. It is going to require some commitment. It is going to require something of you. Now, can you go to heaven without being committed? If you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you put your faith in him, yes. Okay? But I challenge you to show me a person that allows the God of the universe to step into his soul, to come into his life, and it not make a change. I don't think that's possible. And so what Jesus is saying is that he wants you to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this, because we often make the the main application of this story about being willing to sacrifice, commit, etc. And that's not a bad take on this, okay? But that is not exactly the main thing that Jesus was talking about. I want you to understand this. Because remember, Jesus said this before he ever died on a cross. And so he told these people that were standing there, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Now, were they thinking about Jesus dying on the cross there? No, they were not. You know what they were thinking about? They were thinking about a Roman execution. They were thinking about a Roman torture that would end people's lives. In other words, what he's saying, take up your cross and follow me. Carry your cross cross. You know what Jesus was describing? A death march. And and what he was saying, and I don't want you to miss this, what he was saying was to these people, not just, yeah, you got to be willing to sacrifice, and yeah, you got to go the extra mile, and you got to be willing to do that. Yes, that's true. The Bible teaches that. But what he's saying right here was something completely different. What he was saying was that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you got to take up the cross. You got to die to yourself. You got to die to your own way of thinking and follow me. Now, 
what in the world does that mean? Well, I want you to understand that what Jesus here was saying was, uh, out of 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, The eyes of the Lord search through the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. You know what Jesus was saying? He was saying that you've got to be willing, you've got to be willing to be an all-in kind of Christian. Not just with your commitment to God and serving in the church and so forth, but he's saying you've got to be committed to the cross. You've got to be committed to what Jesus did. Now, I want to show you three commitments, and then we're done. Number one, you've got to be committed to the cross. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you've got to be committed to the cross. Now, what does that mean? Well, the idea of taking up the cross is not just the willingness to suffer hardship, but it is the big picture of what is necessary for salvation. You know what Jesus is saying? You got to die to your own thinking about salvation and you got to carry the cross. You got to follow me. Now, you know what he's talking about here? Don't miss this. The average person, and this has probably been true throughout history because we all like to think about being moral, being good. You know that the vast majority of people, if you ask if they deserve to go to hell or heaven, they'd say heaven every time, almost everybody. Even those who have never committed their life to Christ. Why? Because in our heart, the way of the thinking of the world is that we embrace our own goodness. We embrace the moral deeds that we do. I, I, I say it this way. Even Christians. Now, I'm going to give you a new, um, a new phrase. Maybe you can chew on this and think about it. But you know what many Christians are guilty of? I call it moral deism. You say, what's that? Well, they believe in God, but they think that the real reason that Jesus came or the real way to approach God or the real way to go to heaven is to be a moral good person. That is what the vast majority of Americans believe. It's what the vast majority of even Christians, people who claim to be Christian in America, believe. Did you know that? We believe that Jesus came to make us good. Now, you should be good. Should you be moral? Of course. When you get saved, when you follow Christ, will you be moral? Absolutely. Will you be perfect? No. You still have a sin nature, and you're still going to sin. But listen, most of us think that what Jesus came to do was to make us a better citizen, a better member of the community, a little nicer, easier to live around, a better neighbor. Now, should you be those things? Yes. But listen, that is not why Jesus came. Jesus came. What did he come for? To take up the cross. What did he do? He did it to die so that the world might live. Jesus did not come to make you moral. He came to bring dead things to life. That's what Jesus did. Now listen, don't miss it. You got to take up your cross. So what does that mean? Well, it means you got to die to your old way of thinking. Do you know that, like I said, most people think that the way to be a Christian is to be good. The way to go to heaven is to be a good person. My grandmother, not the one I just told you about, but my other grandmother, Laura Miller, my dad's mom, she was a moral person. She would let you know how good she was. And I remember after my dad got saved, he would witness to his mother. And he'd tell her, Mama, you need to get saved. And she'd go, oh, honey, I'm saved. I, I'm good. And he'd say, no, Mama, you need to receive Christ. You need to repent. You need to admit that you need him. She goes, oh, no, 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 I'm good. I get saved every night. That's what she'd say. And for the majority of her life, she was a moral person by her own standard, not God's standard, but by her own standard, she was a moral person. And uh, she didn't drink, smoke, or chew, or run with girls that do. All right? She was a moral person. She was also a miserable person. She may have been one of the most narcissistic and selfish people, even though she was generous in some ways, that I'd ever met. Because she had not been saved. She was not a true follower of Jesus Christ. And finally, my, she started, when my dad started his church in North Carolina, she started going. She had to go see her son preach, right? 
And so she would go, and for a few years, she'd go every Sunday, every Sunday. And my dad would preach the gospel, and he'd give an invitation for people to be saved. And finally, one day, my grandmother was 70 years old. Before my dad even gave an invitation for people to come forward, she got up out of her seat, and she walked to the front of the auditorium. My dad was standing in the pulpit on the stage, and he's like, Mama, what do you want? You know, he thought she'd lost her mind, you know. And she turned and faced that congregation. She said to the top of her voice, Today, I confess Jesus Christ as my Savior. And my grandmother got saved and she got baptized. And by the way, you know that even though she was 70 years old, even though she was a good person, morally speaking, there was incredible change in that woman's life. And I had the privilege of doing her funeral. She was 83 years old. And I know that my grandmother committed to the cross. She took up her cross and she followed Jesus. Once again, he's not just talking about dying to your selfishness or your ways. He's saying you've got to literally, utterly refuse. And by the way, that's what that, that phrase there means in the original languages. It means that you're, you're rejecting that way of thinking. You're rejecting that normal way that most of us think, that the way to go to heaven, the way to uh, you know, please God is to be moral, to be good, to keep the commandments. And you got to reject, you got to die to that. You got to take up your cross and follow him. He says that's the only way that you'll truly find life. And by the way, when you put it in the context of finding life, as in that that's the way you discover Christianity, that's the way you really truly discover life. And those that try to cling to that old way of thinking, they cling to the world's way of thinking. They cling to the world's way of thinking about morality. They cling to the world's way of thinking about moral deism. You know what's going to happen to them? They're going to lose it. They're going to lose the very thing that they thought that they were keeping. And by the way, Jesus says the same thing to you and me. And so what we need to do is make a great commitment to the cross. Jesus calls for a radical abandonment of your own identity and to embrace his sacrificial death on the cross for salvation. If we're to follow Christ, we must commit to the cross. Here's the second thing. you got to commit to the cause. we got to commit to the cross of Jesus, but also to the cause of Jesus. He says, for whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So in other words, he's saying the idea of saving your life is a commitment to what most humans commit to. Now, some of these things are necessary but they should not be the priority. They should not be the greatest commitment in our lives. For example, people want significance. You want to know that you matter. You want to know that your life matters. People uh, look for food and clothing and shelter. Got to have that to live, right? People look for comfort. And that's not what God necessarily has called us to, but thank God for the comforts that he gives us. Thank God for his love and his blessings. We seek significance with our time. We act as if we own our time, but it's God's. Uh, We pursue our own agenda. Now, what Jesus is saying is this. If you're trying to discover life by that, you're going to be disappointed. If your goal is just to make money, and look, I hope all of you make a lot of money and give a lot of money here at this church, all right? I'm all for making a lot of money. I'm not for money owning you. I'm not for that being the cause of your life. You know what Jesus calls us to? To his cause. The cause of saving people. The cause of being active in what he has called us to do, his mission. He says that what you and I must do in earthly terms is we must commit, listen, to the 
salvation of people, for the gospel going out to the church of Jesus Christ, and for the abundant life. You know, I'm afraid that a lot of Christians miss. They get in on the salvation part, but they miss out on the abundant life part. Now, don't misunderstand what the abundant life means. The abundant life doesn't mean that God gives you a bank account full of money and a vacation home and all that stuff, and you don't go to church, and you don't serve God. That's not the abundant life. Now, that might be abundance of possessions, but that's not the abundant life. You know why? Because just as what he said here, you know what happens to a lot of people? They commit to the good life, and they find out that it's not so good. In the end, they're empty. They're like, I did all of this for that? I mean, I climbed the ladder. I sacrificed. Now, once again, I'm not saying that you should be unsuccessful. I think you should be very successful. I believe that Christians can be much more successful because they've got God on their side, and if you follow Scripture, you'll be successful. But by the way, the idea of success is not defined by the world. Oh, some things are, but that's not God's only definition of success. God does not look over the banner of heaven and go, Gabriel, come here and look at her. Did you see how much money she earned this week? Oh, my goodness. High five. God doesn't do that. He's never done that. You know why? Because he made you. He gave you the talent. He let you be born at a time and in a place and around people that were able to influence you to get you to where you are. And it wasn't so that you could just get a lake house. And I'm not against having a lake house. I hope to have one one day myself, okay? But listen, that's not what life is about. It's got to be more than that. God is not shocked or surprised when you are successful financially or when you are successful in some endeavor that you make. You know what God is impressed by? He's not impressed by the number of zeros in your uh, checking account. He's impressed with absolute 100% total abandonment, total commitment to Him. That's what He's impressed by. And if we're going to serve, we got to have that. Well, let me give you the last one. Uh, you've got to be committed to the cross and the cause, and you've got to be committed to the call. God calls us. Now, how are some ways you can do that if you want to help so that he saves and transforms and brings the abundant life. What are some practical things to do? Well, it is very practical. You commit to serving. Now, I know sometimes we think, well, what I do doesn't matter that much. It does. It does. What if, you know, you heard the old saying, for the lack of a shoe, the horse was lost, and for the lack of a horse, the war was lost, or the battle was lost, and for the lack of a battle, the war was lost. I know you think, well, it doesn't matter if I show up or not. Listen to me. It matters greatly. He said, well, they won't miss me. Yes, they will. You say, well, they got more. Somebody can step in and do stuff that I was going to do. Well, praise God if we've got that. But listen, God is concerned about your commitment. He is concerned about your abundant life. He is concerned about you. Not just that you sit on the sideline. I'm afraid that there are no sidelines in the race of the Christian life. God has not called you to sit on the side. He wants us to commit to serving, to fellowship. I know a lot of people think that they don't need the church, but I beg to differ. In fact, it's not me. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. It matters what the Word of God says. You can't read Scripture And come away with any other conclusion other than that it matters that you're in church. That it matters. Now, does going to church save you? No. But it sure will help sanctify you. It sure will help you grow. It sure will help you with the things that you truly, really need in life. You know, God created us for fellowship. You weren't designed to live the Christian life alone. And I know we love our independence and we, we love our, 
uh, individualism and uh, especially men, the manliness that goes along with that. But God has not called you to be alone. And I'm not talking about in the context of being married or whatever. What I'm talking about is that God wants you to be a part of the fellowship. He wants you to commit to spiritual growth. Now, let me tell you this. You're not going to be perfect. I hate to burst your bubble, but I'm not perfect. Just ask my wife. She will tell you very clearly. There are t- sometimes, some, and I'm going to be real honest here, okay, transparent. There are times that I say things that I should not say. And I'm not talking about talking about people. But there are sometimes words that come out of my mouth that are words of anger. And I don't know why. My wife used to tell me when we were younger, she said, you don't have any emotions. I said, anger is emo- an emotion? What do you mean? <laughs> you know? And there are times, even as a pastor, sometimes I let a word slip every once in a while that I shouldn't. You say, are you proud of that? No. But you know what I have committed? I've committed to growth, and I've committed to serving God, and I've committed my entire life 100% radically to try to make a difference. And I realize that I have feet of clay, and I realize that I'm, I'm not perfect. But I've got some news for you. Neither are you. And that's why I love some of our things on this little banner. It says, we embrace the mess. Aren't you glad that God's not looking for perfect people? You know what? The verse I read earlier, when it said, the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro throughout the whole earth for people's hearts that are committed to him. He's looking at the heart. Uh, We say, and it's in the lobby, this church is the perfect place for imperfect people. Now, if you're perfect, I'm going to kindly ask you, don't come back. (laughs) You say, why not? You're going to ruin a good thing, all right? So, (laughs) but I got news for you. You're not perfect. No one is. So we got to be committed to the cause. He says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know what the word ashamed means there? It means to deny, listen to this, this will help you. It means to deny his power, his sovereignty, and his eternal purpose. That's what it means. Now I want you to get that. If I don't deny the power of God, it's going to change the way I act and talk and think. Why? Because God's got the power. We have people in our Wednesday prayer time talking about the power of God and the sovereignty of God. Beautiful testimony of how God's more powerful than any disease, than any problem, than anything that happens in your life. We don't deny His power. We don't deny His sovereignty. You know, sometimes, I know this is going to shock you, sometimes life doesn't work out like I think it ought to. I mean, the world would be a better place if everybody would just do what I told them, right? So, I mean, we all agree with that, right? No, you don't agree with that. Most of the people on our church rolls don't even agree with that because I say, you should come to church every Sunday. They don't, all right? So, but my point is this. Don't, don't miss it. Um, God is not looking for perfect people, but he is looking for people to make a radical commitment. Now, lest you be scared away by that word, when he says, don't be ashamed, it means that you're not ashamed of his eternal purpose. Let me ask you a question. Are you living for now, for today, for tomorrow, or are you living for eternity? I've got to tell you, if all you're doing is living for the nasty now and now rather than the sweet by and by, right, you're going to be disappointed, and you're going to fail, And you're going to get down to the end of your life and you're going to look back with, dare I say the word, regret. As a Christian, you know what you'll never regret? You'll never regret the time in your life that you spent serving God. I've done a lot of funerals. I've been by the bedsides of a lot of people that were coming down to the end of their time. 
Never once have I ever heard anybody say, Pastor, I regret serving the Lord. I, I regret being committed to the church. I regret all the time that I spent reading God's Word. I totally regret that. I've never once heard that. But you know what I've heard more times than I care to count? That they regret the time that they did not serve God. The decisions that they made that were just about this life. Never once have I heard anybody say, boy, I wish I had spent more time at the office. I've never done a funeral where a guy said that. Boy, I wish I'd spent more time away from my family. Now, you may have thought that, but that's not what you're going to think at the end of your life, right? And so the point is, saving your life means that you cling to the things that humans normally cling to most. But gaining your life means that you give it away. Now, the question is this. What will you do with the one and only life that God has given you? What will you do? You only get one. You don't get any do-overs. According to what I've read in God's Word and what I've experienced in life, all the money in the world won't buy you one second of heaven. All the money in the world won't extend your life one minute. What will you do with your one and only life? Heavenly Father, help us in pursuit of you, be willing to lose our way of thinking, lose our ideas, and totally pursue you so that when we do, we will gain true life. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for your love. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if you're watching online, if you'd say, Pastor, I need that life I need Jesus in my life. Or if you're in the room, you can pray something like this. And listen closely. Uh, there is no magical prayer. There's no magical words to a prayer. But it's the condition of the heart that turns to God and says, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I admit that I need you. I'm asking you to save me. If you'll do that, it is the one prayer that God said he will answer every single time without fail. So today, do you need that? Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life and forgive me of my sins and save me. Help me with my faith. I commit myself to you. And just like you said, Lord, I want to take up my cross. I want to make that radical commitment to salvation. Now, if you want that, I encourage you to say that prayer to God. Everybody look this way, if you would. Uh, what we're going to do now, and, and I realize I've gone a little bit longer than normal, but hey, we've got lunch. You don't have to go very far, and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, let me tell you how to use this card. If you're new, fill it out. Let us know that you're here. And uh, if you made a spiritual decision today, use this. Uh, if you got saved or if you're interested in getting baptized, which, by the way, we've got three people to baptize after the service today. And if you have been saved and you'd like to be baptized, then we want to invite you to get baptized. You say, well, I didn't come prepared. All it means is you'll get wet. That's it. All right. So um, and, and it's going to be really we even have towels and we have hair dryers and we have I started to say extra clothes, but I don't think we do because we don't have a multitude of sizes, so I'm not sure what size you require. Uh, but if you would like to, uh, to get baptized today, you can let us know. Um, or if you want to sign up for being a member of the church, listen closely. Church membership here is not like it is in most churches. You know what it is in most churches? You sign kind of like you join, and you put your name on a card, and um, there's really no commitment. You can join a church, 
you don't have to go to church, but you can just join. It's kind of like joining Facebook. I am a member of Facebook, okay? I know that may shock some of you because I never, and I use the word never, get on there. Now, there are people that do for me, and we have a church page and all this kind of stuff, but can I just be an old man for a second? I despise social media, okay? That's, I'm just saying, all right? Now, is, is it good? It, there are some good things about it. No doubt about it. We use it at our church. But let me tell you something. I'm a member of Facebook, but I'm kind of like some people that are members of a church. I don't ever, ever, ever engage with it, okay? Now, don't be that member. We don't believe that's membership. We believe that uh, participation is membership, okay? So, uh, if you want to join the church, you mark on there. Um, and then here's how you can, here's what I want you to do. Drop your next step card in. Remember, if you want to volunteer in youth or you're interested or you'd like to talk about it, put youth on the bottom. If you have a prayer request, drop it in. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. And while they're coming, I'm going to give you some instructions and some announcements. Now, how can you give? How can you give? Number one, you can give them the offering as it passes, okay? Um, now, many of us don't carry checks or cash anymore. Um, and so what are other ways you can give? Well, 95% of all of our giving now comes through digital giving. And you can give by going to the website, stillwaters.online. Stillwaters, with an S, dot online. Not dot com, not dot net, not dot org, but dot online. All right, so you can give that way. You can uh, text the number 84321. All right, y'all, I've said it so many times, you know it. All right, 84321. Or the most convenient way to give, and Kim and I uh, give uh, every time we give. We give on the church app, and that helps you with announcements and keeping up and joining a small group and sermon notes and small group notes and all this stuff. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So you can give that way. Now, let, let me challenge you, okay? Speaking of offering, uh, you know that over the next several weeks, we're taking an offering for what we call uh, reach or serve your world. We're doing serve your neighbor, serve your world. Serve your world, we're helping the children's village in South Africa for the AIDS orphans, and we're sending medical supplies, buying medicine for people that don't have any in the Dominican Republic. Okay, now uh, you can participate in that. And by the way, I hope we have 100% participation. You say, well, I can't afford to give $1,000. I didn't ask you for $1,000. Uh, now, if you want to give $1,000, we'll take it, all right? But here's the point. Everybody can do something. You say, well, I, I can only afford five bucks. Well, give five bucks. Participate. Serve your world. It makes a difference. Most of you can do far more than that. And so take a minute. You say, well, I'm kind of tight on my budget. Let, let, let me give you an idea. Skip Starbucks just two days and give. Or um, take your lunch instead of... Has anybody noticed that the price of food has gone up? All right. You go... Like, I bought, like, just a meal the other day at one of these restaurants that normally was much, much less than this, and it was 23 freaking dollars. And I didn't buy caviar, okay? Um, but here's the point. Take your lunch. You say, well, I really want to give, but I can't afford to. I get it. Uh, times are tight. I get it. But you know what everybody can do? You can find a way. Everybody can be involved. And let me tell you why you should do it. Um, because, and I'm going to show you some pictures of these kids uh, when I get back from South Africa, of some of these kids that you've helped over the years that have gotten saved and their lives have been changed and now they're adults. You've made a difference. I mean, there, there, there's one girl, I'm going to have a picture with her, hopefully if I can do this. There was one girl that came through our children, and I say ours because we helped start it, we didn't own it, but uh, we, we helped them get the first building. We helped them buy the acreage. We helped them, okay? Um, you know, when she was a little baby, 
she was found, there was a helicopter flying over a field and saw what they thought was a dead child in the field. They came down, they rescued this little girl. They got her in the foster care system. She had been raped. There's a reason she was dead. She was a baby, okay? A baby. And this girl went to Ndawi Yatimba. That's the name of that children's village. Place of hope is what it means in Zulu. Ndawi Yatimba. And that little girl, listen, from some of the money that you gave, she was able to hear the gospel. And she got saved and baptized. And one of the beautiful things about this children's village, because almost all these kids are AIDS orphans, they got her involved with a counselor on a regular basis and helped this young lady. And today, she is a beautiful young lady that has graduated from high school now starting her life. You say, well, what I do doesn't make a difference. She would disagree. She would disagree. Because I can tell you that when we serve our world selflessly, God uses us. You know what I believe, and I truly believe this? When you get to heaven, you're going to be surprised at how many people you were able to touch with your generosity with your serving, with your involvement. You may not think it's making a difference now, but I, I don't remember if I said this here or not, um, but there was somebody that was my camp counselor when I committed my life to Christ. There was somebody that worked in my youth ministry when I committed my life to Christ. There was somebody that made an influence in my life. And by the way, they've touched yours as well through me. You just don't ever know. You never know. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be shocked at the number of people that say, thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for serving. Thank you for giving. I truly believe it. Well, I mean, I apologize. I, I've talked really long today, but we only had one service today, and it is a holiday weekend, and we got food, all right? So, um, there, for, if you're a guest here, go to the black tent. We've got a gift for you. Uh, the Father's Day raffle. You can start doing that today. You buy tickets for a dollar each, and for every dollar, you get a ticket. And every dollar that is spent goes to help these AIDS orphans in South Africa. Okay? So you want to say, well, I'd like to get 20 tickets, please. That's $20 that goes to the offering. Okay, you'd say, well, I'm going I'm, I'm to get those Braves tickets, uh, which, by the way, are two very good tickets. It includes parking. It includes uh, popcorn and ice cream and 10% off of everything, all right, that you buy. Uh, free popcorn, free ice cream, and uh, you can't go to the ballpark without getting a hot dog. So uh, instead of it costing $84 for a hot dog, it'll cost you $8.40 less than that. Okay, so. <laughs> but... All, all joking aside, if you're wanting to enter into that Braves ticket giveaway, you can do that. Um, don't forget about our outreach opportunity. Uh, it will start uh, June the 2nd? No, June 3rd, Monday night. We're going to meet here around 530. We're going to go to, uh, I think it's Canyon Creek or some uh, an apartment uh, homes around here, and we're going to pass out invites. They've already given us permission. And then on that Wednesday night, we're going to give away 200 free barbecue meals. And um, it's all paid for. And so all we need is volunteers to come. All right. And so if you we already had a lot of people sign up. You can also sign up on that as well. Uh, all parents get wristbands for the kids. And then we've got baptism today. And I'm so excited about this. So we'll do this after the service, and um, I'll, we got a mic set up, so I'll call your attention, and we'll baptize, okay? Let me say the blessing and shut my mouth, all right? So, <laughs> Lord, thank you for this food. Thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you for 
the sweet fellowship you're going to give us today. Help us to realize that all of this is possible because of Jesus. And God, help us to have a radical abandonment of our own agenda, our own ideas, and take up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.